Well, good morning, everybody. I'm so glad you can join me here. And uh, we've been walking through the DNA series. I've got a video from a missionary in Cambodia that we're showing in our campuses this weekend. I really wanted to show it online, but I just, for the safety of those who serve there, I didn't want to do that. So sorry you can't see that video, but when I mention it uh, in, our, in, our, in the message, just want you to be aware that I had to use some caution because often we just can't uh, broadcast some of the names and places that we do ministry globally. So thanks for joining us this morning. We'll get started here in just a second. I'm so grateful for Brian because he is on board as, a, as the, the mission of people helping people find and follow Jesus, that we partner with somebody who has that passion and that vision, and yet he doesn't do that locally. He does that over in Cambodia. Well, I want to welcome you to the last day the final of a series on the family church DNA. And I want to use uh, this as the platform to sort of bookend what we've been trying to convey that one, we know that the value of you here locally, wherever you are at, is absolutely essential, that we must live on mission to fulfill God's mission here locally, wherever you live, work, and play. And that was the, the first four weeks. So if you've missed that, I encourage you to go back uh, and get caught up with all that we've been trying to express on our desire to, to reach people of Douglas County, as well as, as we've been talking now for the last two weeks, to reach the nations. And so I want to remind you of this picture about the upper and the lower room. And this, this idea was just that in our local congregation setting that we can't get fixated on the place or the personality, the programs or the people of the gathering where we're at. They are valuable. We need to gather. And it's absolutely critical that it helps us to build up the body. But that's not the vision or the mission we've been called to. And so in the upper room, you see there's that little picture frame. And I want to talk about that for just a moment, because what I need you to hear is the value of the lower room when the vision is the upper room. So here we go. The upper room looks a little bit like this, that the vision we want to continue to, to press forward on is gospel saturation that leads to a multiplication movement that the lower room focuses on a gospel saturation. And we do that where we live, work, and play. But we also do that as we partner with the nations. And of course, our mission statement, people helping people find and follow Jesus, that that is the, the mission we are called to. And finally, that the trim, the, the values we have, that we are absolutely essential. We must be in a transforming process by the work of the Holy Spirit that we engage in meaningful, authentic relationships, that we innovate in the way in which we present the gospel. And finally, that we have a passion to see the multiplication, multiplying movement as we proclaim Christ here and to the nations. And so today I want to bring you to the book of Romans. And if you want to open up there now, we'll be in Romans chapter 10. And I began this section of our DNA series talking about why the nations need to be reached and why you and your, and your location need to be reached. It was because God so loved the world that this was, this was a display of God's love for the world when he sent his son Christ to die on a cross and then rise again victoriously and offer us new life in him. And secondly, it talked about the how. And last week was the absolute, I hope you heard, that we must be in a partnership. And partnerships do work locally, but we've been focusing on the idea of partnering globally as well, finding people who are engaging unreached peoples and partnering with them to reach the nations. And now today I want to focus on the what's next, the glory of God to be revealed to all. And so Paul is going to be writing. We're going to look at uh, the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans. And he's speaking to the Romans, but he's also uh, emphasizing a few things as you walk through the book. He's, he's making it clear that Israel had rejected Christ. But since Christ has come, the beautiful gifts of the gospel are now available to all. And so we're just grabbing a piece of this, this uh, passage out of chapter 10. So follow with me, chapter 10, starting at verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? 
And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. This is a, an incredible moment where we, we take now all of the, the information of what we've been talking about, the DNA of Family Church, which is ultimately the mission of God, and then put it to practice today and, and look at it from a tangible, re, uh, real perspective as we're moving forward. And first, I want you to, to really pick up this last statement there of how beautiful are these feet. And this isn't a, about the physical beauty of your feet. This is about feet that bring good news, feet that bring the beautiful gospel truth that life, that forgiveness, and that relationship can be restored because of faith in Christ. And so we begin with one point I want to pull out of the passage is everyone. Everyone encapsulates God's heart. He desires that none would perish, that all would come to repentance and believe in Christ. He desires that all the nations, all the peoples, the tribes, the tongues, the, the, uh, the gathering of all the, the diverse beauty of his creation would come together and in one voice declare that Jesus is Lord, everyone. That is the heart of God that we must continue to remember. But Paul makes it very clear, and I want you to look at that in verse 13. Paul says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is a very clear uh, separation of even though God's heart is that all would come, that is his desire, there is still a part to play that all must call on the name of Jesus. That each one must realize that Jesus is not just a good teacher, that he was, in fact, the Christ, the one sent who would pay the penalty for our sins. And also, we must understand, as Jesus has made it clear, he says, I am the only way, the only way to the Father. I'm the only truth. There's a lot out of the people out there, a lot of ideas that, that claim their truth. I am the truth and that I am the life. That's the only way to find true life is through me and life abundantly. And there is no other name. So I'm asking you first, before we move on, have you confessed that Jesus is Lord? Earlier in the passage, it says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, then you will be saved. So make this personal first. Have you confessed? Have you confessed that Jesus is Lord? Do you believe it with all your heart? And finally, are you committed to what you were called to? Because you weren't just called to you have a ticket punched and an entrance into heaven. You were called into a mission, into an existence that's more than you or me could ever imagine. It's a beautiful mission. And are you willing to invest your life for a life on purpose? And so I want to make sure before we move on that everyone must call in the name of the Lord. And secondly, I want to point out the how. How? We're going to see in the passage again. How is this to be accomplished? How can people hear? How can people believe? And, and last week I tried to impress on you this sense of urgency as that picture of a ship I used last week, and people were, were frantically gasping for air, beating the water, looking for help. We must have that sense of urgency. People are dying, people are being born, and we do not know the day that the Lord will return, but he will return. So are you listening to the Holy Spirit? Do you feel that sense of urgency welling up in you? Are you being transformed by the Holy Spirit's work in you, to, to have that sense of urgency? Are you experiencing the spiritual gifts that have been given to you when you put your faith in Christ so that you're seeing the, the outflow of the Spirit in your life and developing a sense of urgency? And are you excited about the unstoppable passion that's been given to you? God's heart, placed on your heart, that says, go, therefore, make disciples. Go and co-labor with the Spirit. Let the Spirit lead you and do the work together to see. And so we continue on the passage, verse 14. He says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? 
And how are they to believe in him whom they've never heard? Do you hear the call of the Spirit? Who will go? Does anyone care? Is, is anyone ready? Do you feel that sense of urgency? Do you, do you respond when the Spirit says, over there, they're ready? Do you feel that sense of urgency? How? How can they hear? And then the last part he says, and how are they to hear without someone preaching? I think often we read this passage, and for many of you, you go, oh, I'm not a preacher, but I want to make this more tangible and real for you. It says this, that preaching means basically this, to proclaim the truth of Jesus. That's what you've been called to do. That's why you've been given the Spirit, the ability to do that. And you've been given this gift because you believe. So who will proclaim the truth of Jesus, salvation found in him? Who will tell? Who will live lives that shout, Jesus is Lord and he is worthy to be praised? Will you live that life? Will you, will you partner with the Spirit to be transformed? But we have to continue to partner with the Holy Spirit and be laborers for God's mission. We must continue. And so I want to celebrate and, and just bring in some real things that we've been doing as, as family church, as God has led us. And I want to celebrate with you. And I know some of you know the names of the people that I'm going to be talking about, but for safety and security on this message, I'm not going to broadcast their names today. But I want to bring you into the movement of God and how partnering is having an impact from here to the nation. So let's start here with this picture. This is a, a home being built, and this is in Africa. And many of you are part of a Christmas offering. And in that offering, we said, we're going to help plant a well. Now, this well will be a source of health, of, of good water for the community where this house is being built. But the better part is that this well will be a beacon for those who desire to have healthy spiritual life that they will seek living water because those who we partner with in this region are ready. They have the gospel, they proclaim it daily in their lives and they look forward to opportunities where they can begin to share and build relationship because of a well that you're investing in. And I look forward to bringing you updates over the next several months uh, as we work through this year to figure out uh, how that's gonna work out. Did we raise enough what we might have to do to, to help this effort? But that well will be a great opportunity to partner and see the gospel extend into a, a group of people that are yet to be reached. Secondly, this week, I love it, I got a picture of a car. And many of you invested in this. I came back from Africa in August and uh, a lot of you jumped on board and wanted to be a part of providing a car for one of our, our blessed gospel partners there. And here's the cool thing, though. I want you to, to hear about the heart of this. Many of you, you and myself included, we'd go, oh, hey, look at the new car. And you would go to talk about all the features and the air conditioning, the cruise control. But that's not the response I got. The response was, thank you. Thank you for investing. Because the car that, that this worker had was junk. It was horrible. But you know what it said under the caption of the picture that he sent me? It says, thank you for the car. There's now seven seats for new believers. Man, do you hear his heart? He's, he's not looking at the, the features or the, the, the bells and whistles. He says there's seven seats available for the movement of God to happen. Man, do we ever look at our, our cars from that perspective? Do you ever think about the seating capacity in your house as, as a place, the number of seats available for, for new believers? What an exciting time as we've finally got that car purchased and now he can continue to minister. And I want to bring you into something that occurred in, back in 2019. 2019, there was a VBX fundraiser, uh, a chance for the kids as they came to learn about Jesus to be challenged to invest as families in a building. And this building is now completed. But this is a radio ministry in Cambodia. And this radio ministry goes day after day in five different languages to proclaim the gospel, to sing spiritual songs, to draw people into worship. And one of the interesting things, though, is it's not just that it's, it's putting the word out there. There have been people and stories of people 
who've heard about Jesus through the radio waves. And they listen on their radio, and we've heard stories of people who pick up their bag and they go on a search from village to village looking for one person who could tell them about who this Jesus is. And you're investing in that. That's partnering here to reach the nations there. And then, of course, we have the Mexico team that's going this March. Now, not everybody's uh, in the picture that's on the team. We couldn't get them all assembled, but 52 of us are taken off and ready to go. We're preparing. We're getting all the funds together. We're asking for prayer, prayer over the team. And this is a chance for you to partner because this team will go and they will proclaim Jesus. And they will work with people who are unreached from the southern parts of Mexico who've gathered in the area of Baja where we're going. And they'll go and they'll serve and they'll go to love and they'll go to partner with the local church in the Baja so that that when this team leaves, there will have been an impact that draws people to that local body. And then there's this picture. First, before I talk about it, I want you to celebrate that the Krung Bible is close to completion. And we're praying that this is the year, that this is the year it will come to completion where the Kroon will have in their own language a completed, accurate scripture to learn and grow and study and be transformed by the work of the Spirit through his word. But this picture, this is a people group called the Brow. And in 2019, we committed to seeing them also get the Bible translated. And now at Family Church, we're looking at, uh, currently we're actively working amongst seven unreached people groups. I told you there's about 7,000 to go, and we're doing the best we can to make a dent where God is calling us. And you support that through your prayers. You support that through tithes and giving, and the goal and the dream is that the ends of the world would be reached. And we're a part of that journey, and I praise God for that. So the question I want you to ask is, how will Douglas County receive gospel saturation? How will the nations be reached? And it comes down to the last point of the day. We have to commit to live sent. We must get a vision that we must be committed laborers, partnering with God, committed to seeing his mission fulfilled that all would hear that everyone who hears would call on the name of the Lord. That is the dream, the vision, the mission that we're called to. And God is at work desiring that you would partner with him through that. And so we look at the passage in verse 15. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Today, if you have placed your faith in Christ, if you have confessed that he is Lord, you have been sent. Jesus has told you, go. Go and proclaim Jesus. Go and and share with others. But the beautiful news of that, remember the, the great commission, those words that Jesus said, he said, go therefore, make disciples, baptizing them. You remember that? When he gets to the end of the statement, as he gives the command, he says something so beautiful. He says, but I am with you till the very end of the age. I am with you. So you don't do this alone. And that should give you comfort to know that you're not sent to go so, to do something for God away from him. You are go- called to do something with God and join him. And so when you have beautiful feet, what you bring is truth, the truth of the gospel, that Jesus is the way to life. You bring hope. And there are so many who who hunger for hope for the future because their, their situations are difficult and their surroundings are stressful and sometimes dangerous. And you bring hope. And beautiful feet bring love sent by the Father. Do you have beautiful feet? Are your feet on the move bringing good news? So how do we live sent? What's next then? If the world is yet to be reached, what's our call and how do we engage in this? Just a few ideas, one that we must continue. And many of you have heard of the 1040 window, but I just want you to look at that picture for a moment. And I want you to look, first of all, at all the red across those hot desert places. This is this is a difficult part of the world that remains. And some of you picked up that there's even there's even red dots in America. 
You see, some of these people groups are entering into your communities. And for some of you, I think you feel the, the tension and the pressure that, that the culture you grew up in is changing so drastically it feels foreign to you now. I just want to encourage you. We must continue forward. And the goal would be that all the red dots that you see on this map, that they all would hear the gospel. But it's going to take willing sacrifice. We can't lose ground here, but we must go there. We can't forget about our, where we live, work, and play, but we must press on to see who else we can reach. You also have to realize that it's going to be difficult. These region, regions are not only difficult from the terrain, many of them, whether it's hot or dry, or whether it's stormy, but there's persecution, and that makes it difficult. This is the reality. Jesus said, look, there are going to be those who want to persecute you. I want you to know that persecution will increase. I also want you to know that hostility will become more aggressive. But the beauty of this is that as we go with Christ, he knows what's coming and he's there to walk with us and shepherd us through it. I love, I was just thinking about this, that the intensity is always greater when the clock is running out. The intensity is always greater when the clock is running out. Have you ever noticed watching games as, as the clock is ticking and they've got to get the final shot or throw the ball or whatever it is, the intensity increases. And I believe the, the clock is running out. The day will come. Jesus will return. So we must not be afraid to step into persecution. We must be willing to stand side by side with those who will go to places where it's difficult. I would also say that we must continue to take God's word to all peoples, that we, we need to continue to, to fund efforts for translation, to partner for discipling, encouraging those who are baptizing, praying for those who are coming to faith, praying for those who are entering into tough areas, that we need to provide finances to support the needs and provide resources for what they will need where they go. And finally, we need people to go. People who would say, yes, here I am, send me. And so maybe you're asking, so how do I really join God? I've heard about what family church is doing and, and what is happening. So how do I do this? How do I, how do I engage? And so let me close with this. I want to encourage you that you can live sent. And here's three ways that will help you get in that path. One, you must live fully surrendered. Learn to live fully surrendered to the work of the Spirit in your life. And that's, that involves a lot of things that, that provide great movement. Sometimes it's just we need to start confessing. Other times we need to listen to the prompting of the Spirit. It says, go here, talk to them. Do this. Uh, be careful there. We need to live unashamed of the gospel. We have to live unrestricted and learn to uh, organize our lives so that we're not restricted by where we might be called to go. We need to be willing to go whenever and wherever and however God calls us. We need, and the only way I believe to do that is to be fully surrendered to the work of the Spirit in your life. You see, if all you've heard today and for the last several weeks is that this is some kind of message about how to work for God, then you miss the point. And I want to make this clear. This is not a message on how to work for God. This is a message, an invitation on how to live fully surrendered to God's call in your life and to join him as he leads you. To live fully surrendered to God and to join him as he leads you. It's a beautiful journey and it's a different picture than what some of you keep holding on to. I've got to work. I've got to work for God. And he says, no. No. I'm calling you to join me. In fact, if you go to work for me, you're probably going to find you won't do the work that I'm actually calling you to do. So go join God. So first, I encourage you to live fully surrendered. Second, to live sent, we have to learn to live generously. Generously. And there's three areas. One, our time. The time that we're, we're given, and we fill our time really well. We're good at that. 
And I want to encourage you to evaluate your calendars, look at your schedules, and ask the question, have you opened up and made available time? Time to meet with people. Time to help people. Time to disciple people. Is there time in your schedule? We've got to live generously. We've got to open up time to be generous. Second are your talents. Some of you who are mechanics or doctors, counselors, teachers, whatever, investors, you, wherever you call your profession that God has gifted you with the mind for, and the talents for, living generously means not just using those in areas of business, but being willing to invest those in areas of great need. You know, there are missionaries around the world that would love to have a mechanic come and fix their car or could use some marital counseling because the journey's been tough. Or they could use a teacher to come work with their kids. Living generously with our talents is to give glory to God in the things that we do because he's the one who gave you those talents. And third are our treasures. Learning to live well in our means, learning to be wise with the treasures we're given, learning to be generous, to share for those who need, to sell if possible when necessary, and to give of your money regularly. And so one of the challenges I want to ask you to think about is where are you giving? What would, instead of the, I have to give, what about a picture like this? What would it look like if you spent your life going, oh man, I've been setting this money aside and I can't wait to see where God would use this. I want to partner with somebody like that well or that car. I want to partner in the movement of this person who's ready to go and proclaim Jesus to that unreached people group. And so I want to encourage you of just this idea. For some of you, it's getting in the game. It's being a first-time giver. It's just saying, hey, I don't have much. I've got $5, but I'm going to work to, to figure out how I can reduce my expenses so I can be more generous. And as you give to Family Church, as you give uh, your, your offering, those go to help support local and, of course, global. And then for those that are regular givers, or if you're a first-time giver, maybe it's time to consider just regular giving to see what God might do with your finances as you surrender them to him. They are his after all. And for some of you, it's proportional. It's a, an ever increasing in the joy that you find when you start to realize I can give more. And then finally, of course, the generous giver. That's the goal, that you have uh, organized and ordered your life in such a way that you can be generous. And when you hear of opportunities, you're ready to financially jump in. We do need givers and we must live generously with our time, our talents, and our treasures. And finally, to live sent means to reveal God's glory. To reveal his glory. To do that, it starts here in your heart. Before you worry about the nations, before you worry about the neighbors, let's make sure that you're doing the, the important work of living out a transformed heart as you've surrendered your life to Christ. Surrender fully and let your mind be transformed as you, as you work through the, wor the word and meet with others to, to talk about what's God calling you to. And the goal is that you would live a life on display with an eternal purpose. I was listening to Gary Brashears. He said it this way about God's glory. He says, God's glory radiates his character and qualities. God's glory radiates his character and and qualities. And we glorify God when we live so that God's character and qualities are on display in our lives for others to see. What is the mission of God? That you would display his glory, that his glory would be revealed. And if you don't know what his glory is, it's his amazing love that he provides. It's his compassion. It's his generosity and his graciousness over us. It's his kindness and his forgiveness and his faithfulness and his righteousness. And when we live for him and with him and he works out and through us, we put on display his glory for others to see so that some might come to believe. Beautiful feet bring the beauty of God's glory. And I just want to challenge you and encourage you this journey, I heard this quote said it this way, that the direction 
is more important than the speed. So I would encourage you to consider what direction are you on? Are you in a path of transforming work with God, fully surrendered, living a life on mission that would proclaim the gospel and his glory? Or are you living for yourself? Are you living for the job or for, for the finances? Or have you forgotten your first love? If you're a follower of Christ today, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you that all things we can do this together as we partner with God and through the Holy Spirit. And I thank you guys so much. I hope that you are inspired through the DNA series. And I just want to encourage you that there's so much goodness that God has for us. I hope you enjoy the journey because I know that I am loving being on mission with God. I love you guys. I'm going to release to the campuses and I'll look forward to seeing you soon. Well, as we kind of wrap up this DNA series, I can't help but keep bringing you back to the most essential part. To live sent, to live fully surrendered requires prayer. Just ask God today, God, what are you calling me to? What is it that you're saying? You, uh, you have something for me. What is it? Show me your way. And I would just encourage you to pray that God would open your eyes to those around you that are in need of hearing this great truth. So that you could be the, the beautiful feet that bring good gospel news. So one, I just encourage you to, to begin to figure out what does a lifestyle of prayer look like? So when you rise and when you sleep and wherever you live, work, and play, that you would engage with God to find out where he's calling you. And second, for today, I just want to press in. We've been talking about learning more about missions, about excuse me, about the mission of God, <laughs> learning more about that, but also learning about the global mission effort. And today I want to focus on sending and going. There are many who are ready to go and serve in difficult places. And sending means standing behind them, shouldering the burden and providing things that help them go. And finances is one of the number one barriers of sending people who've been called. So uh, begin to pray about where you might be called to send somebody. And then, of course, the goers, the go. If you're being called to go, I would encourage you to do the work with God to find out where is it he's calling you specifically and then to get engaged into the process of being sent eventually. Uh, it's, a, it's actually quite a joy when you find out your calling is clear. And when God lays it on your heart, you will find it very fulfilling and very fruitful. Uh, I also want to, before I send you out, just encourage you that we're going to start the book of 1 Peter next week. So if you want to do some pre-reading, encourage you to do that. We're going to be walking through that for quite a few weeks. There's a lot to unpack about God's gracious, uh, just unbelievable love for us and how we should respond as a result of that. Love you guys. I hope that you are blessed today as you go forward. Thanks for joining us for the DNA series. Look forward to starting First Peter with you next week. See you all soon.